complex narratives of being taken by alien beings into UFOs on beams of light. The Air Force is trying to cover up with a picture of Venus and the moon. From my own point of view, I'm going to be very disappointed if UFOs turn out to be nothing more than visitors from another planet, because I think there could be something much more interesting. I'm not telling you that. The United States government is telling you that. Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome back to Disclosure Team. I'm really excited for this one. Um, I've been familiar with this case for some time, but a couple of years ago, seeing the uh, Netflix show Unsolved Mysteries uh, feature this uh, incident, it, it really kind of opened it up to me. And um, I really can't wait to speak to my guest tonight. And all I'm going to say before we bring him in is, as always, please keep the chat cool, calm and collected. Please respect everybody's uh, voice and differences of opinion and uh, everything will be all good from there. It's good to see so many of you in the live chat already. If you have any questions throughout the interview, please pop them in capital letters or if you're feeling generous, super chats are always, always welcome. And uh, any support that is given is so, so appreciated. So thank you, guys. Let's jump straight into it. I uh, I want to get this going straight away because we've got a lot to cover. So uh, please welcome. Tom Reed. Vinny. Tom, how are you? Hey, man. Thanks for having me, buddy. Oh, it's my pleasure. You know, I've been sort of speaking with you briefly in the background for a little while and and planning this interview. And so, yeah, I'm just so glad that the day's here and we get to have this discussion. So, yeah, yeah I've been looking cool. forward to it. You know, uh, it was kind of a unique thing. Uh, you're in Sheffield, England, and our case was in Sheffield, Massachusetts. And we have a common friend with a, with Toby and Tim. And and so, yeah, this is one I was looking forward to. So once again, uh, yeah, thanks for having me, man. Ah, like I said, my pleasure, my pleasure. Well, listen, Tom, I guess the, the initial thing I'd like to do is for anybody that's not familiar with, with the case and what actually happened back in 1969, September, um, if you wouldn't mind just starting and, and sort of laying out the incident for us uh, to give us an overview, I'd really appreciate that. Yeah, sure. Um, I guess the key things are that we, uh, we owned a diner and... Um, the diner itself kind of made history. That's kind of how our case made history was not through our family so much, but through our diner, because that's where people talked about what they were seeing. And uh, for, we were diagonally across the street from a racetrack. Okay. And this is back in the 60s during the, the race to the moon, you know, the space race and all that. And so either you were a farmer or for the most part, or you worked at one of the government funded manufacturing facilities like Sprague Electric or GE or Command Aerospace or Pratt & Whitney, whatever it was. And a lot of people don't realize this either, but uh, NASA used to be in Massachusetts. I mean, they still are to this day, but they were across the street from MIT and Boston was only a couple hours away. So you had all this money being funded by the US government to NASA to other manufacturing facilities in and around the Berkshires where our diner sat um, to make all these capacitors, whatever it was that the government needed to beat Russia to the moon, okay? And because the racetrack was diagonally across the street, a lot of those people ate in our diner that worked on the goodwill message that was left on the moon and, and or worked in and around the space race. So when UFOs were seen in the area, it was talked about in our diner because it was a secret space program. So they couldn't really talk about it while they were shopping, right? They, it was like kind of in church, right? Like, you know, you could talk about God in yeah. church, but you're not going to have a conversation with God you know, in appliances at, you know, Best Buy, right? Because, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. So that's kind of was our family's diner. So in and around this time, um, we were, uh, I was helping my family close up the diner and there were already been sightings in the area. We were already privy to some of that, but this particular night was extremely hot and it was a holiday. So a lot of people were outside barbecues, that kind of thing. Uh, there were parades. So a lot of people saw what we d were involved with that probably wouldn't have seen that if it wasn't a holiday. So all these things like lined up, right? So we're leaving the diner. 
going through this bridge that everybody pretty much knows about. When entering the bridge, my grandmother immediately said that there was too much light for the headlights in our car. It just something didn't look right. It was all lit up. There was like lights coming through the planks in the fl floor, if you would, or the, you know, the bottom of the bridge. Sure. And so when she came out the other side, she had turned around to say something to me because I was giving my brother candy and stuff and he was too young. She thought he could choke kind of thing. And when in doing so, she saw this sphere, this white, silver, whitish type of sphere that was rising up from the banks of the river. It didn't come out of the water. I don't know where it came from. By the time I saw it, it was already higher than our car. Right. There was another sphere to our right, which was orange, and it looked to be uh, moving on the inside. It was like a like a roll to it or something. Okay. But we kind of split the two. So we had uh, this white sphere, which was higher up, and this one that was like orange, lower to the water. They were both over water, but one was much higher than the other. And as we kept going straight, this one kind of went behind a line of trees and kind of went in the same direction as our car. Right. And I, I think H and aliens did a pretty good job on this, um, this part of it as did Berkshire's UFO. But what a lot of people leave out is that there were three objects. So if you watch H and aliens, they show the sphere, you know, and if you watch unsolved mysteries, they show something different. So there were three. And by the time we split those two and went down this narrow dirt road, which used to be for emergency vehicles and horse and buggy. I mean, this is a long time ago. So sure. my mother found like a spot to pull over, which was near a telephone pole where the utility trucks had been just developing this road. And so she pulled off to the right. And as she started to pull off to the right, cause we were going to stop and try to find this white sphere that we had seen. That's what we were looking for. All of a sudden, it felt like we were deep underwater. I'll never forget it. It was like, you know when you dive into a pool or you're in a in the ocean or a lake and you dive to, there's this pressure around your body? Yeah. That's what we felt. And it was like everywhere. It was just like, man, it was like restricting. And then, you know, the sounds of life kind of came to a stop. There was no more breeze, no more crickets, no more anything. You know, um, you didn't hear any branches rustling or it was just dead quiet, very surreal. And then there was this flash of light. And, you know, it, it was just the strength. All these things were happening within, like, maybe a two-minute period. And during that time, we were actually looking out the window. So we are feeling this, hearing this tapping sound, all while we're looking out the window. And that's when this saucer-type thing came into the view of us. Now, maybe it was there all along. We didn't see it. I don't know how it got there. I just remember seeing, like, the front of it was like emitting like a, a reddish amber tint right. on the top only, not the bottom. And it was only on part of it. And this thing actually didn't have like landing gear. I don't remember seeing windows. I don't remember seeing anything. It was just, it was about a hundred yards in length. I always thought it was, you know, pretty big anyway. But when Jan Green talked about it, when we, you know, talked uh, over uh, Unsolved Mysteries, she was the same thing. She was so close to it. She couldn't see end to end. And so this, it, I've gone back and I've looked at where the trees were and it was a good hundred yards in size. This thing was big. Wow. And it looked like a turtle shell to me. You know, right. as a kid, I remember I referenced things as what, how they hit me. You know what I think about when I picture it, it looked like a turtle shell, but the side of it also had like lines in it, like um, almost like a snake skin. And the middle of it was a lot wider and thicker than the top and the bottom. So the middle of it was like this big, like a tire, you know, sure. like a tread on it, yeah. you know? And so it was probably 80 degrees that night when it should have been more like typical weather might've been 45, <laughs> okay. super hot night, holiday, the windows were open. There was no gleam or reflection on anything because we didn't have air conditioning in the car. And so now we're in the middle of three objects. So I've had a lot of time to talk about this and, and try to make sense of what was happening at this sure. period of time. So if this picture a clock, so this craft was probably at nine o'clock. The sphere that we saw was around six o'clock, seven o'clock. And then the other one would have been around, you know, five o'clock. Okay. So 
we were in the middle of three objects that were maneuvering all at the same time, doing something. So we thought, you know, afterwards we look back at this, that maybe there was a communication going on. And we were in the middle of this communication and why we felt the way we did. Yeah. Because again, there was this, we heard a tap, 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 like stones hitting uh, underneath the fender wall. And then, like I said, that pressure and then everything went silent. And then that flash of light and this eruption of crickets came out of nowhere. And that's the last thing I remember from being in that vehicle. I so mean, it was just, like boom, 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 boom. Right. But then did you feel like at any point that you, or looking back, do you feel like you'd left the vehicle and gone somewhere else? Oh, I remember where I was and everything, or at least part of it, you know. Uh, we weren't in the car anymore, you know, all all four of us. I mean, it was my mother. My mother had been driving. My grandmother was in the passenger seat. My younger brother, Matthew, was to my right. And at the time we were going home, we were like all in conversation. We were talking. And then the, all these, you know, vessels, if you will, or whatever it was we were part of, kind of just captivated all of us. I don't remember any conversation after that except all staring at this thing. And I think my mom said at one time, you know, what the hell is that? Mm. And that was about it. And then everything just went um, almost surreal, like, uh, you know, uh, like we really weren't there, you know, yeah. almost like we, it was a, almost a dimensional feeling. But at the same time, we felt something. So if it was dimensional, we wouldn't have felt something, I guess. I, I, it's confusing as to what happened because that's why I go, what really happened to us? Because if it was something where we were maybe being in the process of something happening, happening to us to move us somewhere or however that would be, why would you feel that, you know? Um, and all of us felt it. And, and the next thing I remember, I'm, I'm like on a, on like a table type of thing, like a, with a, well, I'm sitting on something in a large open area that was much larger than what I saw. And that, again, that's why I say, you know, people say, well, you're, you know, abducted, right? Well, I wasn't on the ship. I wasn't on the craft because where I was, was a lot bigger than what I saw. Right. You could have fit three or four crafts in where I, where I was. And so I have no idea. <laughs> I can only surmise. I think it was like, um, I've said it would look like an airplane hangar. Uh, maybe it was something governmental underground because there was a Nike missile sites, the Minuteman missile sites. You know, you had the NORAD towers there. You, you know, I, where, I don't know. Sure. You I know, understand. I really don't know where I was, you know. But I can say this, that I had slid off and jumped onto the what looked like an asphalt floor. I don't remember anything other than that. I, no carpet or anything. I just remember this blank floor. Yeah. And uh, I was grabbed by my left arm, and it hurt. And I was taken out uh, a door by this individual. I don't really remember what he looked like. I just It was a long time ago. I don't remember. Um, but it hurt. It was strong. And then um, I was taken down this hallway with very high walls. Uh, I'd say that, um, you know, 12 to 15 foot walls. They have, everything was white, very narrow. At the end of the hallway, I was taken to the left. I remember the hallways. I don't remember anything very cool. I don't remember anything. It looked very elementary, very industrial to me. Okay. And then when I was brought into this room off to the right, I was to sit on this table and the wall in front of me was all like glass block. If you remember glass block, Holmes had it way back when um, in front of me and it kind of bowed like a coffee can or something. And right. there was a pocket to the left and a pocket to the right where you could go out into another area. Now I was on this table and looking straight ahead. And that's when I saw what uh, Yes Theory had introduced on the show. This is what Omar was holding. And there were two insect-looking beings to my left that had what looked like bamboo legs, uh, very thin bamboo-like arms or limbs. Uh, the center looked like, uh, you know, like a whitish gray. Uh, and they were facing a wall. So the two of them were facing a wall. They were only about six, eight inches away from the wall. So whatever it was they were doing, they were looking at something in this space. Right. I jumped off the table. I was coming in and I was uh, one minute. I was like feeling okay. Then the next minute I was um, anxious and then I was calm again. I was anxious. 
and my emotions were all over the place. And I ran out the right side of this opening and I walked and I ran or walked whatever into this huge open area that was larger than like an empty Walmart, but it was round. The big whole area looked round and there were three hallways that came into it. There was one right across the way from me. There was one to the right and there was a wide one to the left. So it looked like a Y with the bottom of the Y being about as wide as a four lane road and okay. the other maybe a single or double lane road. And I was immediately brought back in. I was put on this table. An apparatus came down from the ceiling. It's separated into two parts. The, where I was sitting rose. I was laying down. It came over me. I don't remember having clothes on at that point. Um, there were what looked like uh, large packs of raisins that were affixed to my body on the left side. And, uh, you know, there was movement. There were other individuals, if you were there. Um, I remember a couple bumps to the head. Um, then I remember being back. I could hear my mother, uh, I think it was my mom, yelling, family members yelling. Right. Um, I don't remember my brother so much. Um, although he remembers a lot of attention to his foot. He had a brace on his leg. Okay. So I was brought back into the area, the hangar, where I first was. And then I remember being back in the car. Now, when we came to in the car, um, we all came to at different times. But what was interesting is my grandmother was now in the driver's seat. My mother was now in the passenger seat. My, my brother and I were in the same positions in the back. The only one who was uh, awake at the time, or the first one to be awake, was my grandmother, Marion. And she didn't typically drive, you know, back in the days, you know, they didn't, you know, just didn't drive much, you know, true, true. She had a license, but didn't have a car. So now she's got to go get help is the way she worded. I need help. You know, my mom's not responding to me. The children aren't waking up. I don't know what just happened. So she tries to turn the station wagon around to go back to town, but there's really nowhere to turn around. It's this narrow dirt road. So she went down a dirt road, found a spot, went back to town which probably took about four or five minutes. None of us were awake yet. We were all still out. She was the only one awake. She goes into town and goes flying by silks, which is where she eventually stopped. She missed the entrance, went around, pulled back around to silks to get out to go in. When she got out, I was just coming to myself. And I remember seeing her through the windshield of the car as she was about to walk into silks convenience store, which was near our diner. Right. So she starts to walk up the steps. I get out and I'm yelling, Nana, Nana, you know. She goes in. I follow her in. She walks right by the clerk and goes to the back of the store where there were bikes and strollers and all kinds of different things. I'm trying to grab her arm. I'm calling her. Um, you know, she uh, wasn't really making any sense. I don't know if I was making any sense. The clerk noticed that something's off. Uh, they talked for a moment, but the the uh, police never showed up. The paramedics never showed up. Uh, so I guess what I'm trying to say is she was went there to ask for help. Mm. But what do you ask for help for? Right. And by the time they got involved, I think she felt embarrassed to say what happened. The police, we didn't know it at the time, but the police were already out looking for this object that we had encountered because it was already – went over the radio we didn't know it if we had said something it probably would have made a big difference but you know and the way things happened or we were treated later but it didn't make any sense i mean it was just like we just i remember standing there the register the whole bit just in front of me it was a creepy feeling because we were all just kind of you know going and our heads were like what what just happened you know we're all feeling strange about what you know and and she just sat there and, and he never, you know, called anyone. Right. You know, no one ever showed up. So we go back out to the car. My mom's now standing in front of one of the headlights. My brother's still in the back of the car. We go home. Um, the next day we had to open up the restaurant. And so when we went in, my mother had a white radio over the, you know, over the grill. And uh, on there we go. 
bang, all these people were talking about what they saw. That's my grandmother. That's my brother. That's my sister. You know, all these people were, had called in and were still talking on the phone uh, to the disc jockey at the time, Tom J. He was playing some pre-recorded stuff from the night before. And so we're thinking to ourselves, well, maybe if Nana had just <laughs> talked to him at the register more, you know, things would have been a little bit different. But that's kind of what happened that night. Yeah, it's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. And between, you know, the time when you first came out of the bridge to, to where you ended up at the diner, what was the time period? And did you feel like the time yeah, was off we, at all? Yeah, we um, we were um, sweeping up, putting the chairs up, and we had a jukebox in there. My mom used to throw us quarters and, and listen to music. Um, my bedtime was like 9 o'clock back in the day, so we were leaving about 8.30. So it had just gotten dusk. And when we came back, my grandmother got to Silks. Um, it was close. They were closing. It was almost 11 o'clock. So it was like two and a half to three hours. I mean, it was a long time. So that's another thing. It wasn't like this two hour time frame. It was longer than that. Right. And we all came out of it at different times. So that's something else we, we talk about. It's like, first it was my, my grandmother, although she was a smaller woman, then myself, then my mother, then my younger brother. So we used to think, you know, or talk to ourselves or kind of discuss with people, you know, what if we were drugged? What if it was a drugging type of thing? What if, because my brother goes, it was like a sodium pentothal to me is how he refers to it. And maybe it was something as basic as that because we all came out of it at different times and we're also different sizes. Right. So that's something we, we always thought there was a government involvement that we saw something that we shouldn't have seen. We were at the wrong place at the wrong time. And we witnessed something or we were affected by something. And then government, you know, got involved, extracted us somehow, took us somewhere, made sure we were okay, whatever that was, you know, um, or experimented on us or something. I mean, we're, we're O negative, which is another blood type that was tracked by the U.S. government back in the day because we're the universal donor. Right. We try to find connections, but there are nine of us in our family that are all RH negative, which is rare. That's really weird. Quite honestly, that's that's uncommon. And uh, so that is something different. You know, um, it was rural. Um, was it was was government trying to fly or work on something that they were back engineering and we were part of that? I don't know what the hell happened. I really don't. You know, all I know is that we were there, <laughs> you know, I had front row seats for it. Yeah. And um, and there was something else I was on Fox with, um, you know, Fox primetime. Yeah. And uh, something else that uh, those who truly had an experience that night have bad eyesight. They have this burned out part of their retina. My, my, I've had five operations on my eyes. My eyes are terrible. Um, you know, Melanie Kirchdorfer, who was part of it, she's got sure. the same eye problem. The rare, same rare eye problem that I do. You know, and so the, what, uh, what Melanie went through and what I went through had the same effect on us. Yeah. So, I mean, it all paints the picture, doesn't it? It paints a really, really, a you know, compelling yeah. picture. So, you know, in the following years, how did, how much of an effect or did it play a big part in your life? Was it something that you kind of carried with you or did you kind of, did life yeah, get in I mean, the way, uh, you know? Talk, talking about what happened that night <clears throat> still bothers me to this day. And sure. although I act like, ah, oh, I, I get past it. But every time I talk about it, I get dry mouth and I, you know, bothers. It's understandable. Me. But um, if I'm there, like when I was there with Yes Theory, I was okay at the bridge. I was okay at the park area. But as soon as I go down the road where the telephone pole was, you know, um, I don't do so good. And I don't really know why, because whatever happened, when you think about it, didn't happen there. That's where we stopped. But for some reason, it triggers something with me. Um, but I will say that um, when, uh, y y you know, um, the 1969 incident was not what caused the problems for our family. It was 1967, which made the newspapers and everything. Uh, 16, was, we had three episodes, you know, three incidents of, or contact, if you will. Um, 66 was one that was only witnessed by a handful of people. Um, 67 was pretty, pretty well known. And that's when the Berkshire Eagle wrote about it and the Sheffield incident and the spheres and everything I'm talking about made the news. It's on my yeah. website. I don't know if you read that or not. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so they reran it, you know, 50 years later. Um, but, uh, 69 kind of put a bow around it because a lot of people who were not so nice to us at the time and giving my mother crap in the diner and she was a single mom at the time and she was 28, 29 years old trying to run a diner and, you know, guys are guys, right? So, think, you know, you know how it is. So, um, she endured a lot. And, um, but 
at the same time, um, people were realizing that this was actually happening, you know, and a lot of people saw this. I mean, it was over 250 people were witnesses to it. I think the, um, if I'm not mistaken, the craft followed the, the river, the Hudson River. It actually started in Connecticut, went to Massachusetts, then followed the river down. And what's interesting that in the 80s and 90s, there was the Hudson River Valley sightings, which also followed the Housatonic River and also followed the Hudson, right? So at that, my, my father later on became a, a politician and an attorney. And he was friends with this guy by the name of Robert Bletchman, who was also a lawyer. And Bletchman was putting together a symposium at the United Nations with Mohammed Rabadin, who was the president of the Paris Ecology Society at the UN at the time. And they were revisiting something called General Assembly 33426, which was this idea of all our countries sharing information together with respect to the UFO topic. Right. And, um, and so with that, Bletchman, by the way, uh, Linda Morton Howe was there. Um, Stanton Friedman was there. Um, quite a few people. I, we had no idea what MUFON was or anything else. Sure. At the time, but Robert yeah. was also the, the, uh, the director of public relations for MUFON at the time. And so they're like, Mr. Reed, would you mind if we talked about your diner and the incident? Because, you know, we were part of the space race. Our incident took place during the space race and the good little message that was left on the moon those guys actually who worked on actually ate in our diner and yeah. knew my parents so there was that connection so they thought well he's an attorney a politician their family had a very bona fide sighting maybe they'll allow us to mention that case in support of the hudson river valley sightings because of his my father's you know pillar standing if you will it would carry some weight right and on the anniversary of that meeting my father lost his life wow sorry to hear that <laughs> and our attorney who mentioned it at the un passed about nine months after my father and then the doctor who looked into my father's autopsy and everything he died about a year later so these there's something <clears throat> much more here than than just mentioning what happened right so something toby knows and some other people have very seldom ever written about but know about it is that back in during the in the uh 60s during the space race they were making a lot more than just capacitors right they were making weapons and everything else so my father knew a lot about this stuff and so when he shared that who knows what was actually said at the un because you know i wasn't there right but something caused my father to lose his life. And so why I'm even talking to you or involved in a topic isn't because I don't have anything else to do. It's because I want to pay tribute to my father. I, he was not going to lose his life for no reason, for no reason. He was 54 years old for God's sakes, you know? Sure. Um, Absolutely. Take a, a case to the United Nations on October 2nd and your father dies on October 2nd. Who's, perfectly healthy at 54 after divulging a bunch of stuff at the UN. Is that a coincidence? You tell me, you know, so it's too no convenient. Family, yeah. No one in our family believes that was a coincidence. You know, nobody, it, you have 365 days a year that you could pass. And it happens to be on the same day you go to the United nations and you're talking about classified stuff that had to do with the space race for God's sakes and UFOs and everything else back. This isn't now. It probably wouldn't have been a big deal, but in, but in uh, 92, it was, you know? Yeah, that's um, the question, definitely. So anyway, um, you know, that's how it went to the UN, and that's kind of what we saw. But there was a lot going on in the area. I mean, there were crafts that were seen by children at my school that it was like a ball of fire. It was like a tightly knit ball. That, like we saw off to the right over the water, came shooting right at a bunch of classmates. We used to go sledding at this hill near school. It took like a 90 degree turn. It went down to the road, went over a home. There was a cigar looking thing. I mean, this area was, there was so much going on. So that's another thing, you know, the, the 69 event only made news because it was a holiday. All right. All this, all this other stuff people were seeing too, but then you, 
you know, you're on the bus with your the other kids. Hey, did you see that yesterday? No, he's crazy. And then next thing you know, the bus driver's yelling at the kids to stop talking. Then you go to school, you draw something in class, you tape it to a chalkboard. Some kid rips it up thinking it's a joke. It was, it was just, but there's so many kids were doing this. Like after, after school, right? My, what are the kids? Okay, wait, I'm going to back up here for a minute. <laughs> sure, sure. Go for it. <laughs> All right. So this is interesting too. So a lot of the kids, their parents had to drive them to school because the, again, this is farming community, right? You're talking about the close, you can have a house and the closest house to you might be an eighth of a mile down the road, right? Because you got all this corn and steer and barns and tractors, right? So the bus isn't going to go to everyone's home, right? I mean, come on. So they park at the corners or whatever, where your parents or your mother can take you to the corner, right? Where your dad's out there milking cows or whatever he's doing, right? <laughs> right. Your mom takes you to the school bus. So that got to be old too, because the, the moms had to make them breakfast, wait for the bus. It's February. You got three feet of snow. It's cold outside. Right. And, and so you're like, why don't I just take it to Reed's diner? I'm sure she'll make you some breakfast and you can ride your bike to school. So that's what happened. So before you knew it, my mom would uh, run a tab for all these little kids, right? We're talking first, second, third, fourth graders, right? And uh, she had an area in the back. And back in the, in the 60s, you had those banana seat bikes. Remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she would store all these bikes in the back. And the kids would be dropped off by their parents. They have French toast, whatever they wanted, right? And she'd keep track of it. And in the week, the parents would sell it. But in the meantime, the kids would also come back after school because they had to put their their bikes in the in the back near a cooler, and so they had the jukebox. My mom would give them quarters. They'd drop them in the jukebox. They're listening to the Stones. They're listening to Creedence, whatever it was, and she'd make these big baskets of fries and she'd deep fry them in bacon fat. And all the kids are <laughs> munching out. Well, it's those kids back in the day that remembered all this, and okay. they're the ones who got this inducted into state. So is that relating to the? Um... Because we've got some pictures here I wanted to share. Is this relating to the uh, the governor's citation and, and things like yeah, that? Yeah, so, so a lot of those kids, um, some are now historians. Um, Kevin Titus became a judge. Wow. Um, Galata, whose father was the chief of police, he used to eat there in the morning. He's the one that was on Unsolved Mysteries and pointed up and said, you know, that picture, that's my dad, you know. Yep. Well, he was one that used to eat in our diner. He's like a couple years older than me, but yeah. So he actually went looking for the UFO with his dad that night. They actually were dispatched and went looking for it. That's something else I want to talk about. Unsolved mysteries. Ugh, he straightened that out. <laughs> so anyway, we'll get to that absolutely, yeah, yeah. So back to the kids. So the children that would eat in their diner in the morning, listen to music. Right, this is the '60s. There was no FM stations in our area. If you wanted to listen to music, you dropped a quarter in a jukebox. The only other spot that had a jukebox was the bowling alley. So if you wanted to have a sandwich, listen to the Stones chill out and have a chocolate shake afterwards you ate at our diner right nice. and and everybody at sprague who was working on a goodwill message and everything else working on a space race they knew it too right so that's was a hangout and so that with that said those kids 30 or 40 of them a lot of kids later on when this was um being looked at by the historical society in massachusetts the sheffield case um they were, you know, reaching out to people. You know, have you ever heard of this? Yeah, I used to eat there. I remember it. Um, who else was there? Judge Titus. Who else was there? The, the chief of police's son used to go. So there were all these people that were reputable that remembered all that. And because my father passed, you know. Yeah, yeah. And um, they knew him, you know. And uh, a lot of these kids I went to school with, too. Um he was advocating something that took place in that community, in that town of Sheffield. And so in some respects, there was this interest to pay something forward to him, okay. which became the monument and stuff like that. Then there were donations and then it became a park. And uh, after the state, you know, I took my polygraph test and, and uh, you know, they found the old archives and things. And they spoke to the radio station that actually broadcast this that night. Cause Tom Jay actually was home, got a call. They spoke to the police department and they were trying to find out where this thing was. And th again, unsolved didn't mention anything about this part of it. He drove back to the radio station, broke into the, the, the tape, you know, the real to real type thing to get on the radio and so on and say, listen, if you guys see this thing, call the station. 
That's why Jan Green, who was in Unsolved Mysteries, went back to the station. Right. And okay. was knocking on the door and saying, well, if you just go outside, you'd probably see us right there. So um, there's a lot of things that haven't been told, quite honestly. But the bottom line here, what I'm trying to really stress here, is that if my mom wasn't so nice to those kids, <laughs> we wouldn't be talking today. Yeah. You know? It was the fact that she opened her door to all these kids so that they could ride their bike and they became historians, judges, police officers, you name it. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Now, one thing, you sent me a couple of videos. We've got the polygraph officer who, uh, you know, who spoke with you, and we've also yeah. got the, the lawyer who authenticated the Historical Society. That's document. important, too. Yeah. So, do you want me to play these videos? And, and if so, in yeah, which, I which talk one? about the, the, the lawyer. Okay, so play that. Toby... Toby um, wrote an article a little while ago, uh, worked on an article that kind of talks about how this whole thing got inducted too, because there was a lot, a lot going on there too. So the Kessler law firm, Debbie Kessler was the attorney's wife who actually went to Roswell. She went to the Roswell Museum and the Research Center, and she was looking for anything she could find about 33426, which was... Um, what is it? The extraterrestrial intelligence and human future. That was the symposium held by Muhammad Ramadan. She found some of that um, also in the Black Vault. She found some of it in the Black Vault. And um, anything to do with um, a high net classification or sightings that were reported back in the day. So she took all that material. She got a lot of that from the Roswell Research Library and folded it to the state of Massachusetts. And in doing so, she also ha was responsible for getting it before a judge to authenticate these documents as being a true document because the historical society would not listen to anything that they could not um, deem a, um, a source document. Okay. They can't go off a copy of this or a copy of that. And so with that, the Roswell Research Library, I guess the city of Roswell, played a significant role in getting this inducted. And so, yeah, there's a little bit of a tape. She was recorded for a show that was never aired. So I was given this piece, which Excellent. I think you're going to play. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'll mute myself while I play. Yeah, that's the law firm. You hear the. No, no audio. We had that same problem too, you know, the other night trying to play something. But that's her. Yeah. Kessler Law Firm. My name is Debbie Kessler. And okay. I, my to be ex husband, Frank Kessler, and I own a law office and it's in Tennessee. I've been his paralegal for about 29 years running his law office. We have worked side by side in his um, firm. I actually met Tom by coincidence and as we began to speak uh, and, and get to know each other, we realized that we had a lot of connections. Uh, he knew my family in Miami and had had uh, a lot of workings with them. And as such, we started talking about the things that had happened to he and his family. And he isn't one to you know, talk about that too openly because he knows it's pretty far fetched. Uh, but as he, you know, as we got to know each other, he you know, began to open up a little bit more and more. And um, I will stress to you that in the 29 years, well, actually, I've been doing law a little longer than 29 years, but in the years that I have been doing um, the legal, uh, paralegal and legal secretary work for all those years, I was taught that you are to look at all aspects and to look for inconsistencies. You have to look for um, the little lies, the little things that people want you to believe, the little things that uh, maybe they are not exactly lies, but they want the, the story to lean a little this way or lean a little that way. And over the years, being uh, representing different people and doing things like contracts and, and even divorce work and making sure that we have the right agreement down and the right contracts together, we have to make sure that we are believing the right person because we didn't want five years or three years to come back 
and bite us by them saying, well, this is not the way it was. And well, didn't you understand that this person said this or said that? So uh, Frank and I were always very careful and cautious in anything that we did uh, all throughout um, the practice. And so therefore, in any time I was talking to Tom uh, or even in my conversations with his mother, Nancy, or his brother, uh, Matthew, I've always listened and paid attention and looked for those inconsistencies, whether they be large or small. Um, and of course, I've spoken to Tom much more than I ever had his, uh, his mother and his brother. But with the, the three of them, I've never found any inconsistencies. When his mother has spoken to me outside, away from Tom, her story is the same. Her story has the same details. Her story says the same thing. Uh, when I speak to Tom, uh, his story doesn't change. I've tried to ask him several things, upside down, backwards, forwards, you know, east to west, and his answers were always the same. He hasn't, he hasn't changed. Um, when he began to show us the documents uh, that uh, several of them had gone before the UN, uh, or had been mentioned at the UN and, and were part of a, a symposium there, there were several documents that uh, some people might look at that and say, well, we don't know if that's a real document. But when I started doing research on it and was looking into it, the, you know, the players are real. The people that are mentioned, the signatures that are there, um, all absolutely appear to be real, real people, real people in those positions at the time. Amazing. Yeah, they uh, they were uh, pretty instrumental in, in getting all this, um, you know, moving forward. Uh, you know, Massachusetts, I don't think they had any idea they were going to find as much as they did, you know, with all the witnesses and the and the credibility of those who were part of it and the radio station. And and uh, there was like, you know, some of the articles you read say, oh, there were 40, 40 uh, witnesses. No, there were 40 people who came that were original witnesses part of that 250 uh when yeah. they unveiled the monument in, in uh, memory of my my late father so um yeah i mean it, it's a uh, it's quite a thing to be part of you know um it did it you asked me earlier you know how to change things for me um my mother had asked me uh, when i was young you know uh, what would you like for your birthday or christmas or whatever it was and i said a camera you know sure and if i hadn't seen what i did I wouldn't have asked for a camera to capture it if I ever saw it again, not not thinking I never would, right? Sure. For the most part. But you never know. Right. And uh, so that became my career. You know, I became a, a fashion photographer in Miami and, you know, the whole bit that, you know, opened up a modeling agency and the whole bit. So who knows? Maybe I would have been in like lawn care or vehicle maintenance if it <laughs> wasn't for what I did. Yeah. <laughs> so I try to find the good in it, you know. Um, I'm not one to, you know, there are times it still bothers me. It, it I don't, I, you would have thought by now, no, but it does, you know, even talking to you earlier, it bothers me, you know, I, I don't know why, because I talk about it so often, but, um, you know, I want to get into the, the details, you know, um, you, you know, uh, cause I, I don't know what happened to me, you know, you know, I wasn't, uh, awake for so much of it. Who knows what happened? I mean, I do have like, you know, I got this little scoop mark on my arm. Some people say, you know, that's something I also happen to have one on this hand as well. So I have one on each wrist. Um, mm. I am O negative. We are RH negative. Um, we were in an area that was uh, surrounded by governmental manufacturing facilities funded by the government with NASA and the space race and the NARAD towers and the missile sites. And, you know, I think it only makes sense that there was a military, in, you know, military was involved in some of this and so i'm very careful in, in how i word what really happened to me so when i passed the polygraph test i took right so give yeah. you an example people say well why don't you ever talk about the fact you know you're abducted or what have you well i don't really know who took me from the car i don't know so the part of me really believes that there was a military um you know aspect or part of this right and so with that if i were to just jump on board and say okay you know this is what happened and i'm wrong part of me knows that that i don't really i'm not really 100 percent sure yeah so i could fail a polygraph then what good am i to anybody else in this topic if i fail a polygraph test at this point 
So my gut tells me there was a, uh, a military, um, and there was military involvement. There was a human aspect to what happened to us that night. So I try to be overly careful, but for the right reasons, I think, you know. I understand that completely. I mean, we talk about validity, though. You recently or you have appeared with the uh, the body language experts. They, they're quite yeah. popular on YouTube and, that, and you know, they interviewed you with quite an extensive interview and then they put out a separate video analysis and you know you they would you were legit in their eyes you know and these are four of the biggest experts in the world you know for anybody out there that that hasn't uh, isn't aware of these guys you know they've spoken to bob lazar uh, and other people yeah. outside of the ufo community they cover all things and i have linked the videos in the description below and i urge everybody to go and watch that um because it's really, really eye-opening. Well, it, it, really is, it is what it is, you know. And yeah, exactly. That's why I don't, I don't take liberties. I don't sensationalize things. Uh, I pay. Uh, you know, I'm grateful for those who came forward and, and helped support us. Um, yeah. It was just luck that the radio station was still in business, you know, in 2015 in the same building, you know, that kind of thing. And and uh, a lot of the people in the area still live there to this day, you know. But they're not going to be there forever. I mean, I'm I'm in my 60s for God's sakes, right? So. A lot of them are older than me, and um, yeah. you know the Jan Green, the you know Melanie Kurtzdorfers. She's legit. Not everybody in Unsolved Mysteries was le was legit, but she was. But that's what I want to get into <laughs> next, you know, because yeah, uh, well, man, as we much as you want to, as much as you want to yeah. say about it, but if, if, for anybody that's not familiar, it was featured on the the reboot, which was season oh, one, yeah. episode five of Unsolved Mysteries. It's available on Netflix. Uh, I, well. It's available here in the UK. I can't speak for every country, but I urge everyone to go and watch it. But then yeah. do you want to kind of explain a bit about it just to sort of lay the record straight? Yeah, so, so I was contacted back in 2012 or so um, by uh, a woman by the name of Cindy. She was a segment producer for or, or, or what ended up being our episode. And they were absolutely, you know, uh, they were taken by the fact that this was inducted as an historically true event, which yeah. it was. And um, and so the the whole idea of doing this show was to, you know, um, I had a website in 2015 or so. It was the Berkshire's UFO website, and so it ended up being named that the Berkshire's UFO, not Tom Reed's Berkshire's UFO, but you know, you go to Berkshire'sUFO.com. That's my website. And so um, anyway, uh, they were. Uh, I think that when they went to town and they started talking to all these people. I don't think they knew how many other people were part of it. And so this thing grew and grew and grew till they were, you know, they had, uh, you know, Melanie on it. They had uh, the radio station on it. They, they actually recorded Kevin Titus. I mentioned Kevin Titus was a judge. He was in our, well, yeah. he was the one who actually witnessed the cattle mutilations, which didn't make the show. They filmed a lot with him, but that didn't make the show. So they removed that. So, because that also screwed up the flight plan because they want to show it following the water well, it actually started in Connecticut around 6.15, right around dinner time, and then it went all the way up to Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and then came back towards Canaan again. So that Canaan was hit twice. But the first okay. time, he and his, uh, and his friend were, they had a twenty two rifle, and they were shooting little ping, you know, cans and stuff in the backyard. Right. So it actually started where it says North Canaan. Yeah. Then it was seen in Pittsfield. Right. So Just like that. Yep. And what was interesting, we mentioned, we, we discussed this before we came on the air, was that the orange line seems to pretty much, you know, relate to the path that this object took, you know. But if you look at the water line, and you pointed this out to me, the water, it almost follows the water line. And it does. I mean, that's and, fascinating. Yeah. So it started in North Canada. That's where they found two cows mutilated. And they actually called the National Guard base, which didn't get in the episode. And then... Right. It was noticed, I think the first massive sighting was in Pittsfield, which is a pretty big town, by the way. It's a pretty good-sized little city. Right. And so a lot of sightings in Pittsfield. And, there, and, um, and that's where the NORAD towers were in Dalton, which is right next to Pittsfield. Okay. And so it was seen up there. And then it came through, yeah, Stockbridge. That's where Melanie lived. Remember Melanie Kirchdorfer? Sure. Yes, yeah. absolutely. She lives in Stockbridge. And so in Stockbridge, the water does go to the left. You can mm -hmm. see that. And that is where the lake was, Great Barrington. Okay, That's where the lake yeah. was. Where see Great Barrington? If you go down a little bit, where the B is or the A in Barrington, go up, <laughs> go up a little. Yeah, right in there is where the lake is that Melanie had her experience. 
right, by yep. the way, she had hers about the same time that I had ours because she actually had seen it first. We encountered it about 45 minutes to an hour later, but we came back at, at three hours. She didn't return to the street or the car or see her family till the next morning. Yeah. So she was theoretically very possibly at the same place that I was at the same time. Yeah. Now, then you see where it goes to Egremont. I don't think anybody ever said it went to Egremont, but okay. Egremont is a ski resort. So it's a very high elevation. Okay. And these golfers are the ones that reported it, which it got its Heineck classification. But they were also very high up. And so in some respects, one of them was actually saying it was almost eye level. Okay. If you look Makes down. Sense. So ground, yeah. I wouldn't say it actually went to Egremont. I think it still followed the waterway, but it was definitely seen by Egremont and it got a classification from Egremont, which is on one of those letters that you showed up a minute where you showed uh, from the historical society moments yep. ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so then right around great Barrington again, right. Around, you know, um, actually you see where it says that seven right there in front of Sheffield. Just that. Uh, yeah. There's actually a road. Do you see the one to the right of that? This that, one here. Right there, that's Boardman street. That's okay. where our house was. Oh, wow. And Gina, Paul, who was a witness to this too, along with her father, who was having a barbecue or a picnic, if you will, that's also going to be in our book. She spoke out about it. That's where they saw it. They actually were seeing it here when the craft had crossed the street. They don't show it crossing the highway. So the, right. the craft that they saw was coming down probably in between where your cursor is and the orange dot, right about in the middle of somewhere in there. Okay. Following the waterway, she saw it actually cross Route 7. So it actually went across 7, right? If you go up a little higher, it's probably right about there. Is, yeah, well, <laughs> right in there is pretty much where they saw it cross the road. Okay. So it actually at one point was on the opposite side of that waterway. Okay. And so we left town, which is pretty much where that orange dot is underneath Sheffield, and we went across the bridge. And that's kind of where we met. We ran into it right there. So we think that there were these spheres or, um, you know, I call them a sphere. Some people call them an orb. Yeah. Yeah. What, what Gina had seen looking up o over towards the mountain of Egremont, uh, she said that all of a sudden it looked like the hill had been, in, you know, engulfed in a veil of gold. Okay. So it was casting, something was happening with the color of the, the hill. Yeah. And she saw these orbs like all join and split apart or spheres, if you will. And, you know, that whole thing that you hear a lot about, the round balls, if you yeah. will. That's what she was watching with her sister. And she was very descriptive about it. Now, her, their whole family had a barbecue. They saw it, which would have been just minutes before we ran into it. Just so. minutes before. Because... You know, we live next door to them. I mean, we could, they used to walk to the school bus with me. And so, you know, you're talking maybe three miles from where we were. Right. That close. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's good to be able to put it on a map or a timeline and show, you know, to get that better picture of it. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, on, when it came to the actual show then on Netflix, was there anything you kind of uh... want to touch base on? Yeah, whether it's positive, <laughs> negative, you know, I'll leave it. I'll leave it up to you. All right. Um, the positives. It was the only show to show the path that it took. Okay. Um, they uh, they did a good job. All in all, they um, you know, uh, they they focused on the the radio station, which was important. But I don't think they mentioned that. Uh, you know, Tom J, he was a ham radio operator back in the day, and he heard some of the stuff over the ham radio, Yeah, uh, called the police. The police at the time didn't you know, didn't staff the police department, you know, at 11, 12 o'clock at night because you're talking about a town, but, you know, not that many people, right? So they went home. And and so with that, they had asked him to go on the radio and break in and say, hey, listen, anybody out there, you know, see what's going on? Can you call the station, you know? And so that was the role he played, which they kind of touched on it, but they really didn't. And then, um, you know, they, uh, the next day, the radio station, you know, played a lot of their, the calls that came in. 
And in the 80s, they still had the archive. So in the 80s, when, when this was going to the UN, they actually replayed it. So they did have copies into the 80s. Um, now, Tom J. passed away, but his wife was still around and was willing to talk. So I don't know why she didn't get on the show because the DJ's wife was actually is still alive to this day and lives in the same house. Wow. Um, they did say that they didn't know where the tapes were today. Well, according to Tom J.'s wife, she thinks that they're in Arizona at their children's home. So whether they are or aren't, I don't know. But apparently after Tom J. passed, there were all these uh, these boxes from the station that went to their families. Right. Um, with that, so um, the, a lot of that could have been in the show, but it wasn't. And then one of the things I will say is this. Okay, so the incident took place in Sheffield. Okay. It also was seen in Great Barrington and Pittsfield and Lenox and the whole bit, but it wasn't reported to the police department in those towns. It was reported by the radio station to the Great Barrington Police Department that it was seen over Sheffield. Right. So it wouldn't be in a Great Barrington Police Department's notes. When Agermont, the golfers at Agermont, you know, they were tan off and everything and had their palates set on some champagne and a steak. <laughs> when they reported it, they called the radio station because a girl had an outdoor radio, pocket radio thing. And they called, they went in and used a black dial phone and they called the radio station, which at that point went to Sheffield. There were no reports in Great Barrington. Melanie's family didn't report it. They went home. Yeah. Um, Melanie wasn't there to report it. She wasn't, didn't find herself back in that street till the next morning. Um, you know, uh, Jan Green, who was on Unsolved Mysteries, went to the radio station. The reports were going to the radio station. They were contacting the Sheffield Police Department because it wasn't seen in Great Barrington. So anyway, um, with that, in the show, they show, um, you know, uh, what's his name, Galata. Uh, the family Galata was the police chief and his son, who was in the show, said, that's my dad, you know, hunting or whatever it was. So that was his gas station, a lot of his gas station. He's a good guy, by the way. He's still in the school family, not so much him, but his brother, Tony. Anyway, um, so they used to come in our, our restaurant, and he really liked the fries again, you know, the whole thing. <laughs> you know? But anyway, um, he talks about how he got the call, and his father, who was a chief of police in the area, small town, um, they went out and looked for it because they people were reporting seeing it land. Wow. So they should have focused on that more. Yeah. And not bring in some officer going, well, I don't see anything. Well, because it wasn't reported to you, you know. Um, and besides, it's something else, too. People get this. You can't uh, – a sighting is not a police report. It's not a crime, right? They know that. They, they, you know, why would a document-driven program, you know, lead people to believe something when they know better, right? So if, I, if you saw an, uh, a UFO outside your podcast right now, right? It's not a crime. You can't file a police report. There's been no crime committed. Exactly. But there are sightings. There are statements. And so Sheffield has statements. She Great Barrington wouldn't have anything reported because it wasn't there was no crime committed. And it wasn't reported to them to begin with. So that was that was not, in my opinion, they shouldn't have done that. No, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's understandable. You know, Absolutely. It added a, a weak link to it along with you know, someone else that shouldn't have been in the show, but that's all right. No, yeah. But, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I'd still, I'd still recommend to anybody watching or listening to, to go check it out. You know, it's, it's, it's well put together. I mean, now if you've watched or listened to this interview and then go and watch it for the first yeah. time, at oh. least you know what to look for. But yeah. also we mentioned earlier on the uh, Amar and the Yes Theory YouTube channel came out and filmed huh? with you. Well, I've linked their sort of mini documentary in the description and that's definitely worth watching. They cover it really well. There are really some better ones. I mean, I think one of the best shows ever done on us was Travel Channel's um, UFO Witness was good, but uh, probably the best one, to be honest with you, was uh, Travel Channel's um, UFO Undercover. Uh, they okay. talk about my father the pol being a politician. They talk about how the state, you know, inducted it. I mean, that was a very good documentary. That was by far the best. I think that they um, they went a little further. You know, there's this box, right? They want to stay, the, you know, within those realms, you know, and leave it kind of wowy and leave out what really matters. Um, that particular show, um, I was on it with uh, Lauren Eisenhower. You know, his father was also uh, – our grandfather, you know, President Eisenhower. Sure. And of course, my father was a 
political person. So the two of us got in that show together um, because of the government type of thing. It was good timing, you know, and um, and so uh, with that, they dug a little deeper. You know, they they really did. They talked about the crop circles. They showed the crop circles. They took pictures of that. They actually have a picture of the sphere in the area. Um, you know, and again, um, you know, mention uh, my father and that kind of uh, deeper dive. And, and um, you know, they weren't afraid to take some chances, I guess is the best way to word it. Just like Yes Theory. I mean, they were they were amazing. They did a great job. So yeah, Absolutely. Um, that I recommend. So I'm going to go and try and find that Travel Channel uh, UFO. And it's on, I, yeah, it's on Vimo, I think. Okay, okay, I'll find I'll it. I'll send the link to it if you want. But, oh, uh, that'd be that'd be great because I could be searching for a long time here. <laughs> I'll <laughs> appreciate it, it. Please do. Yeah. Now, listen, Tom. Before we finish off, I did just want to talk about UFO Expo. Oh yeah, uh, sure. Uh, you know, you've graciously invited me to to virtually speak at mm -hmm. the event. I can't wait to do that. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I wanted to just at least show the website, and you can kind of okay. if you want to talk us through it. Just uh, okay. Because yeah. it's such a, a unique event. So, okay. Much. So, um, on, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. UFO Expo um, is a conference that I used to hold in Massachusetts and Salem, Mass, and in Florida. And I was approached by Roswell to um, the city of Roswell, if you will, uh, and uh, Elizabeth Michael specifically to move it there. Uh, because the, uh, you know, the town is known for this type of a, a topic. And, uh, and Roswell played a part in getting our case inducted into United States history. So when they asked me if I'd move it there, I was like, sure, you know, let's right. do it. And uh, so we got an um, unbelievable lineup. I mean, we're going to have um, primary speakers, secondary uh, virtual speakers coming in. Um, you know, Toby's going to be there. You're going to be part of it. Um, we've got a film uh, fest happening. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of cosplay. There's a, a woman that I'm, speaking with uh, Elena who uh, runs uh, Galacticon and uh, right. because yeah because there's a uh, you know two colleges nearby and uh, we thought you know why not add a little cosplay competition thing have some fun with that um, we're gonna have what's called tracks they're not gonna be the same old same old where we're going to just stand behind a podium and go down memory lane we're going to talk about the subject as a whole so Sure. Uh, Travis Walton, Fire in the Sky. Maybe he brings in a couple other people from, you know, from the truck that night, you know, and talks about things that he something a little bit different. We want to broaden it. So we're going to have the primary speaker be an interview with two chairs on stage, no podium, glass oh, yeah. of water between, you know, talking like, like friends, and then have the screen behind where we'll show a clip and then Skype somebody else in or Zoom someone else in to talk about that as a group and then take a microphone, go around the room and talk about it. So it's more interactive. We're going to get more people talking and asking questions to these people that they normally just have to sit on a fold out chair yeah. for an hour and a half and try <laughs> to take it all in. You're like, you know, I need, you know, it's, ah, God, it's like, you know, I've been sitting here for two hours. Right. So we're, we're going to try to open it up and um, bring something a little bit different. So again, you know, Steve Bassett, you know, um, you know, Tyrone Vaughn actually, who's related to uh, Stevie Ray Vaughn. He uh, gave us a guitar to uh, auction off at the event. So it's signed by Melissa Tittle and, oh, and Rita King. She's the daughter of B.B. King. She's wow. going to be, um, she's part of it, yeah. So it's, it is, it's just a unique event and I'm just, yeah, I'm just so honored to be a part of it. Basically it's four events. Yeah. It's and, four and events at once. Again, everybody that's interested, the link's in the description of the video as well. You know, um, so we be selling virtual tickets. Can people watch if they can't make it in person? No, you know, a lot of people ask us that, but, um, we, you know, it's not, not viable. And, you know, right now, to be honest with you, the, we have, um, it's such a big event that I, theoretically we could sell these tickets for two to 50 to $300. I mean, sure. think about it. You saw it. I mean, that's only part of it. You yeah, know, yeah. there's a lot, a lot of money invested in this one. And, uh, yeah, you know, uh, we're also working with the city of Roswell as, as well to re, uh, kindle or start the, uh, main street Roswell event too. And yep. of course the Roswell daily record is part of it. So we really want to keep it, you know, it's a way to say, Hey, thanks to Roswell. Let's do something awesome for you. Maybe next year we broaden it or something, but this year we're going to try to just, it's our way too of saying thanks. But at the same time, it was a good opportunity to bring something uh, uh, different to Roswell. Now, think about this, too. The 4th of July, when they have their festival, there's only so many flights. There's only so many planes. There's only so many hotel rooms, right? 
And so not everybody can always go 4th of July weekend. But now they have an event to go to during spring break. And now they can also go to the museum. Now they can also see what Roswell has to offer, you know, at the same time without, you know, you know, you have spring break is a, you've got colleges everywhere, right? You got, if I, I know if I lived outside Roswell, I'd want to see a festival there again. I don't want to yeah. hear something else. You know, you have the same thing a lot, right? You have the speakers, the same event kind of thing. So it brings something new that complements what's in place. It's not taking, you know, over something or it's not going to be compared to something else. It's just something different. And um, so I'm really looking forward to it. I mean, it's going to be awesome. And it also gives me an opportunity to clear the air on things. That some things I really can't say in the air that you, we've talked about off the air because sure, yeah, I understand. You know, that. some things are just not cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, so it gives me not. an opportunity to add to what happened with our family at the same time, uh, pay something back to Roswell, and have my friends hang out and uh, have some drinks with everybody. Have you ever done a shot with Travis Walton? No. I can't right. say I have. <laughs> you, ever, you ever had a beer with Mike you know, with uh, Mike Barr from Ancient Aliens? No. no. Well, at UFO Expo, you can. There you go. That's amazing. Well, I'm I'm honored to be a part of it. I can't wait to present what what I've been working on. Um, I'm mm -hmm. really excited for that. But uh, again, this has been an absolutely wonderful conversation. I knew it would be. I okay. really, really appreciate you, appreciate you taking the time out. Um, absolutely. And I'm sure you have we'll, the, you have the uh, documents. Can you put those up real quick? The uh, you have the one from the governor. I want to touch on something real quick. I Get do indeed. Yeah, bear with me. Yes, we're running out of time. Don't want to keep uh, it. No, 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 not at all. Did, did you want the history? Is that the historical society letter? Well, that put that up real quick, if you don't mind. I I'm don't mind at all. You, you have please. it. So, okay. So I have this one. Can you blow it up a little bit or no? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. All right. So you see where this will give you an idea of the amount of information that came to them. So if you look at. Um, uh, let's see. Blah, blah. Okay. Uh, WSBS radio station it talks about the September 1st, 1969 incident. Yeah. Um, and that it was, it was issued a high net classification that was from the golfers at Egermont country club. Right. And that's because it was so high. They had a view of it. Um, and then um, J. Allen Hynek, and um, for whatever reason, even though it took place in 1969, it never made project blue book. Project right. Blue Book ended that year. Yeah. So it never actually got in there. Um, but it was issued the high, the classification. It just never got entered, which is unfortunate too. However, um, and you know, if you look at the rest of it too, to uh, you know, factual corroborated evidence and the polygraph test that I had to take for them. I mean, there was a lot. They didn't just you know jump on this for you know right away. This they investigated this for two years. Amazing. The one, the one from the governor. Okay, here's something else. Now, this particular one that you have is not the correct one. Oh, <laughs> and I'm going to explain this. Okay, please, please. <laughs> yeah. So, if you look at the citations and some of the uh, stuff that's floating around out there for those who don't like the topic, you know, fallen angels, whatever it, the problem is they have with this topic. You'll see that they'll say the governor rescinded the citation or the, right. the governor took it back. That's the one he took back. If you look in there, there is no date of when it took place. Right. Yep. He reissued one two weeks later in November. So you have these reporters that go, oh, didn't the governor, you know, rescind his citation? Uh, well, okay. he rescinded the first one. Because he amended it and reissued it. So if you go to the website, you'll see the new one that I has see. the date. And so that's something I wanted to clarify. Then they talked about taking the monument. Do you remember about that? Oh, they moved the monument. Yeah. You know? All right. They removed that. They act there it is. If you blow that up, you'll see the dates on that one. That's the amended one. Yep. Yeah, September 1st, 69. Right. And that's the so, bridge in the background, right? That's it. We were coming out left to right. Okay. Right. And where that uh, white sphere was that also fired these rods of like poles of light in the water is right about right about where that is, where your cursor is, that little hand. Oh, right okay. There. Just on this. The end Real there. close. Wow. You can see the water to the right of the m uh, monument on the right corner. Of oh, the of course. Yeah. I didn't even notice that. Right. Ah, okay. 
And the other one, the one that was like an orange sphere, was to the left of the bridge, quite a ways down, actually. So we actually came out. So you can tell if, yeah. if just by looking at this, though, the white sphere would have been kind of where that water is. The other one would have been on the other side. We split them. Yeah. And then as we went down the road right past this, where this marker is right here, that's where we came into the craft. So we were sitting between all three pieces. Yeah. There, so the there's water's oh, down yeah. there, and then you've got the other craft would have been over here. Right. That's a good shot, too. Yep. There's a little uh, sign that were or, or, uh, right there. Yep. That center piece was donated by History Channel's Ancient Aliens. Oh, wow. Yep. And uh, the sculpture itself was built by Len Morneau, who's the brother of Louis Morneau, who directed the movie Bats with Lou Diamond Phillips way back in the day. Wow. <laughs> So that so what what they did is the see how the bridge is actually I'm hoping I'm you know taking up too much of your time but do you see what those poles are? Yeah, yeah. Okay, those ballards in the rocks. Yeah. The town had an easement or what I would say is a rite of passage to okay. go through this land. This land is owned by a, a dairy farm. So oh, if you back okay. up, if you back up a little bit, I want to show you something. Okay. And by the way, that house in the background, that's Larkins. His his son was a witness to it too. Wow, he's, okay. fought, he's a police officer now. So right here, if you see this path, right, the town, when they block, yep, that's that's basically the road. That's the road we drove on. Right. That's not even a road. It's like a path, like a path right? Yeah. <laughs> so those ballards, when the town put those ballards up in front of the bridge, they not only forbid their own from going through it to use it for emergency vehicles, but they also denied the landowner rights. Wow. So that's the town insane. lost their rite of passage because they they willingly and knowingly blocked themselves off. But what they also did was now they also blocked passage or entrance by the Pine Island Farms workers. So now they have to go all the way around to use the road. So the town actually lost their rite of passage. But they pushed so hard to move that marker. And the way they got it moved was to say that it infringed. It's not blocking the road. It infringed on their <laughs> their expired rite of passage. That is how adamant they were that they didn't want to be associated with the UFO topic. Right. But uh, since then, I've got them on ancient aliens and everything else. So, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, take that. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's so fascinating. It really is. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Well, you know. I'm in no rush, but I guess you got to go. So it's all right. No, no you got any questions? Do... Anybody in chat? Got any questions? I think most were just uh, here. We go. There's one here from Yorne. Hi, Tom. Thank you for sharing all of this. I wonder, have you had more sightings after the first one? If so, were they similar or different? Okay, I will. I will tell you something. So, in uh, 2009, my brother was in Avon, Indiana, and he ended up being part of the Kokomo boom. Do you remember the Kokomo boom? No. That's one you might want to look up. Um, that's where Debbie Cabo lives, who the, the book uh, Intruders was written about her by Bud uh, Hopkins. Yeah. Okay, okay, we yeah. Yep. So it's the same town she lives in. We're friends now, but we didn't know each other then. And so my brother had uh, an incident. He was at a movie theater with his friends, and they saw, again, that orange ball sphere like we saw as kids. What, you know, what we saw as a kid, though, like I said, when I talk about it, the sphere, the, the orange sphere that we saw back in the day was about the size of a Volkswagen bug. Wow. The white one off to the left was like four times larger. It was much bigger. And my brother saw something very similar in size, color, and everything that almost mirrored what we saw originally, you know, that night yeah. in Sheffield, Massachusetts. And and so he um he found himself off the road. He was like trying to follow, they were leaving a movie, you know. Anyway, unknown to him that all these people were reporting seeing that the following day. So he contacted the police because he used to work for SWAT. He was part of that anyway. He right. was a fugitive recovery agent at the time. And so he's like, yeah, man, I saw it too, right? He's got the, he's packing heat. He's like, they're not going to give me a hard time. I'm, a, I'm working with SWAT, for God's sake. So of course, they did. They said, well, if you want to report it, call NAS. And they joked with him. Anyway, that's when the star team came in from MUFON and so on and so forth. And all these people started taking it more seriously because, it, again, it was a mass sighting. Yeah. So he was part of that. But – Interesting, though, is that he remembers having some type of an incident at night in his bed. And oddly enough, 
I did too. And I actually reported it to those I was talking to. So around the same time this happened with him in Avon, Indiana, I had something happen with me at the house. And so did my son. And we had a friend visiting from Florida who was crashing in on a, on a mattress. My, my son used to have the bonus room. And we threw a mattress out. He was, you know, last minute thing. And they all saw this light. My brother um, remembers uh, seeing uh, images and, and, and his same thing my, my, my son was talking about when he said this light came in. It looked like a doorway over his bed that like opened up like the size of a sheet. Uh, our, his friend that was visiting from Florida saw the same thing, saw this light. He called his mother, wanted to be taken home. I remember like almost happy. It was the craziest thing. All this like paranormal activity was happening in our house. The same time was happening with his. And here's the kicker. When he saw that, his son was turning six, the same age my brother was when he saw this in 1969. So we have had to come full circle here. Yeah. We have had paranormal things happen in our house ever since. You know, uh, you know, smudge marks, the things that we see, uh, hear sounds like people walking up and down stairs. And it's so vivid. It's so in your face that you'll actually look at the stairs and you'll hear it. And there's nothing at the stairs. I mean, it's crazy. And my girlfriend was over a while back, right? And she's like hanging out on bed. She had a good, nice looking body, right? So she's like hanging out on bed, right? <laughs> With nothing on, right? We're watching TV and stuff. And all of a sudden, you know, we hear these footsteps coming up the stairs. And we're like, oh my God, it's going to be my son or something, right? So she's grabbing a blanket, covering herself. And I go to the door. We'll be out in a minute. There's nobody there. How strange. Yep. Wow. I mean, they do say, I mean, a lot of people say, you know, experiences, once they have that initial experience, then it, it kind of comes back or repeats, you know, yeah. in a lot of cases. So, you know, that's, that's true. Just, I hear about that a lot. And my mother, her first incident was in 1954. Right. Did you know that? I don't talk about that much. My mother was saying something in uh, Gooseneck, Maine, um, while her brother was being interviewed at a college uh, there, you know. So here's another thing, right? This is crazy. Ready for this? I know I'm rambling. So, so good. <laughs> okay, so, so my mother had her first experience in 1954, and she was later on. She bought a house that was, what is it? Um, oh my God! It was 1554. Anyway, it had to do with the same date. It was right. re relevant to the date that she saw because she was 15 when she saw it, 1954. And she bought a house that was 1954. Then if you go back to the article from the governor, you're going to pull it up or anything that was issued on my mother's birthday. Look at the date. It's October 17th or 20. What, what, so it was issued on my mother's birthday. Um, 27th actually should know that. Um, and the, <laughs> and the Boston globe article that came out about us making us history came out on my father's birthday. So many little. So you look at my father's death certificate, and you look at the article from the Boston Globe that has our picture on it for making history. Same day. That's crazy. Wow. Now, that's... Oh, I so... want to tell you one more thing. Okay, sure. Hang on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is something else that I very seldom ever mention. Um, all right. So, do you remember uh, a movie with Susan St. James? Uh, it was called The Death in Canaan. The the Peter Riley murder. Anybody no. listening right now, look it up. A Death in Canaan, the Peter Riley murder, Peter Riley trial, the death of Barbara Gibbons, however it's worded. It's been like three books, a couple movies. Okay, so that happened not far from our diner. And by the way, I'll tell you one more thing, too, before I forget, that the magnesium that was mined for the atom bomb was mined just miles from our diner. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about. A lot of government. Yeah, anyway, yeah. So when my father married my mom, who she he came into the diner, she was getting picked on back in the day in the sixties, and he was from New York, and so he's like, "Hey man, you know, you want if you want that to eat here, you're gonna apologize, otherwise you're gonna eat, you're gonna leave." And my mom's like, "My hero, right?" So they ended up dating. <laughs> they got married. She taught him how to ride a horse, right? So anyway, later on, when um, you know things were working out, it was like three or four years later, they got married, and he was in law school. And wanted to run for mayor, you know, and stuff like, you know, he wanted to do something 
he was tired of the way we were treated. So he wanted to get into a position where he could do something nice for locals because it was just something he thought, you know, why did it treat you that way? Right. Sure. So he looks for a house to buy. And guess what house we bought? Where the murder of Peter Riley took place. <laughs> God. Yep. So I'm thinking to myself, why would you do that? <laughs> anyway, so, so yes. So where this Peter Riley murder took place, uh, it was uh, like a, had an apple orchard, a uh, nice size house. There was a cottage on, on the property, which used to be an old post office, which is where she was killed. And there was a barn where we kept our classic cars. We had, you know, cars back in the day, we, you know, nice ones. Yeah. Right? I, 442 Hurstoles. This is for another lunch, but yeah, badass. <laughs> so, you know, so um, anyway, so while we lived there, there were times I went into that little house. I couldn't, um, I couldn't stand it. You know, I'm very sensitive to things. And my grandmother swore that she saw, you know, some shadow type activity in there. And so the Warrens came, came in, Ed and Lorraine Warren came down. They stood in our driveway. Um, we didn't hire them to do anything at the time, but they came down and I said, yeah, there's definitely something going on here. So, um, you, you know, just all kinds of stuff. And to answer your, your, the question you had from your, uh, you know, listener, um, also when my son was born and, you know, we had, uh, my wife and I had the same dream. Um, we, we woke up and we mid immediately thought Chris, because he was only two months old. And so we ran out the door cause he was in the crib, you know, next to the living room and everything. Right. And, um, as we walked through the living room, the rocking chair was moving. All the cabinets in our kitchen were open, and my son was face down in a pool of blood. Jeez. So he had something going on with his nut, but he was too weak to roll over. And to this day, he's got a hole in his sinus cavity. Wow. And he was a high school quarterback and everything. Because of the injury, he would bleed sometimes, and, and so it was tough for him to, to see that through. But wow. so we've had the Kokomo Boom connection. We've had... Uh, you know, this incident when my son was born, we've had that also that incident around the time my, my brother's son was turning six and that was witnessed by a friend staying from Florida. Yeah. Um, you know, and then the sensitivity that we felt when we went into that home and stuff. a lot of other people didn't feel it, but we did. And we felt it strongly enough that it really bothered us. So yeah. I don't know if what happened and why we're so sensitive has to do with, you know, the UFO connection or, being in that house, maybe we, did we bring something back with us? You know, begs the question, doesn't it? So many possibilities, but yeah, but it's all it's part so of us, right? So, so just to wrap this up, right? So I'll be, you know, someone I'll be with somebody and be like, oh yeah, you know, I saw a UFO or I saw this or I saw. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Or you know, uh, I had activity in my house and there were these footsteps and they're like all dramatic about it. I'm like, eh, well, you know, happens all the time, man. <laughs> you know, they don't take up much room. So that's kind of how nonchalant it gets. But the minute right. I talk about what happened originally, you know, it uh, it affects me. So I don't know. I, I mean, I, I literally I appreciate you being able to be so open and honest with me on the show today. It, it really does go a long way and I appreciate it because um, I know, you know, you must have done it so many times. But yeah, I can't thank you enough. So uh, right. thank you. And we'll speak again soon. You know, yeah, we'll, hope so. Good, good connection we've made. And so I just want to say thank you to everybody that's been here today. I really do appreciate everybody in the chat, uh, everyone watching it live, and everybody that watches or listens after the fact as well. Thank you so much for the continued support. And uh, I'm going to be back uh, next week uh, where I'll be live with John Greenwald Jr. So for now, guys, thank you so much. Take care, and I'll see you soon. Thanks. Goodbye.